Big Smoke. And welcome to Shift F1, a podcast about speedy race cars. That, by the way, is Australian uh, slang for a big city. Big Smoke is a big city, such as Melbourne. Uh, it's also what was pouring from Max Verstappen's car this weekend. I'm Drew Scanlon. Uh, joining me, Rob Zachney. How are you, Rob? Energized. Uh, it, just so happy to have something different to talk about. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Danny O'Dwyer is uh, on assignment again this week. Um, so he will be joining us, I believe, next week. Uh, so stick around for uh, your favorite Irish co-host. If you are new to this podcast, there's usually three of us, but a uh, very warm welcome to you anyway. We are uh, happy to have you. If you're new to Formula One itself, we recommend listening to our preseason primer episode, which assumes no prior F1 knowledge and explains how the sport works and who everybody is. So if you'd like to go back and listen to that, it is episode 257. Also, this show would not be possible uh, without our uh, audience at patreon.com slash shift F1, where every month we release uh, new uh, uh, ad free versions of the podcast, along with bonus podcasts and videos exclusively for our patrons that cover racing documentaries and films, F1 video games, experiments with other racing series, and a lot of weird things. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to all that fun stuff, head over to patreon.com slash shift F1 or click the link in the show notes. This month is a <clears throat> drive to survive month. We've taken the first half of uh, season six uh, for March, and uh, as soon as April rolls around, we will post the, the second half uh, of Drive to Survive. Um, spoilers, we, uh, well, I won't say anything except to say that our opinions maybe of the first and second half of the seasons are different. Uh, but a special shout out to our uh, title sponsors over on Patreon. Uh, Get Rich or Die Ryan, Agave ATX, Cyphus Training, Turf SCS, at Team Blackjack, Michael Maves, Gordy's Army, at Talking Autos, Olivia Evans, TelemetryDeck.com, FTC, Drew Stewart, Bailey Foot, Abdullah Althani, MasterCard, Venmo, JC Racing, F1 Team, Abraham Getchell, The Space Above Us Podcast, Bunny Crimes Appreciates the 14 Hours of Sleep, Sniggs, Alex Goucher, Alex Goucher, uh, not Alice Goucher, that's a... Uh, they did uh, Feed My Frankenstein and uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy, you know. Uh, Max Voltar, Circuit Demon, Troy Stammer, William Rumpf, Irvine Clinical Research, Lachlan the Madden Man, and Jason Kelly. Uh, we've got quite a race to talk about here, Rob. So what do you say we hop right into it? Starting with The Grid. Uh, not a surprise, perhaps. At the, the front here, pole position, Max Verstappen. Uh, what may be a surprise is right beside him, second place, first row, Carlos Sainz, what, two weeks after abdominal surgery, puts it right next to the championship defender. I mean, I know it's laparoscopic, folks, but you probably wouldn't catch, you probably wouldn't catch me wanting to climb into one of those things uh, and then get buffeted around by the G's. Uh, that close to a surgery you're still I'm pretty sure you still you're still rocking stitches in a few places yeah yeah uh third place lando norris followed by Shaw leclerc in fourth oscar piastri the first of the australians uh in the grid lining up for this australian grand prix uh in fifth sergio perez qualified third but was penalized penalized three grid places for impeding another driver during qualifying i believe it was holkenberg um so he will start from sixth George Russell in 7th, Yuki Tsunoda in 8th, Lance Stroll ninth, and Fernando Alonso, who went into the gravel in his first run in Q3 at a site that we will return to, as it pertains to Fernando Alonso, later in the race. Uh, Lewis Hamilton will line up 11th, bumped from Q3 by one Lance Stroll, which, you know, it's been a, it's been a rough streak, let's say, of late for Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton. Um, 12th place... Alex Albon, he, uh, <laughs> the only Williams, Rob, in yes. this race to take the start. So, did, so yes, he, he wrecked his car in pre-practice two, was it? Uh, I believe it was the first one. But either way, um, totaled, totaled his car. Yes. 
and Williams does not have a spare. And I say does not because we are not out of the woods for this. This is where we reveal like kind of and we'll, we'll have a story we're going to talk about again, like kind of how wing in a prayer Williams is right now. But Williams not only doesn't have a spare car, uh, didn't have a spare car at the race this weekend. They don't have a spare car for the next several races like they've got. They were talking about this during the they end up talking about this during the race, but like. Williams is going to replace the the lost car, but I think that was supposed to be their spare that they've got. So like they're going to like go through this this next leg of the championship, uh, you know, like while the while the championships out in Asia, without without any margin for error. Like if this happens again, they're going to have to bump Logan Sargent again from from a car because they don't have the spare chassis uh, and equipment just to like kit out another another car and have to run during the race. Now, it kind of bugged me. And I'm curious how you felt about this. Like I may, maybe I'm getting like just I don't know, tired of F1 commentary or overly sensitive to this, but like it started I hate it when they try to create storylines or drama when I just don't think there's any reasonable way you can argue that there's that much drama. And that's what they that's what I felt they were doing with some of the stuff with Logan Sargent, where it was like, uh, you know, talking about what a hard thing it was, how, how, how difficult it was to ask a, ask a driver and what a sign, what, you know, what a sign of like, not disrespect, but like clearly like showing the packing order over at Williams, uh, that the Sargent was, was asked to give up his chassis. And I'm sitting there like, yeah, of course. Like, I don't, I don't understand. First of all, Logan told, a ton of cars last year. So I am pretty sure that like in terms of karma, he would understand that like if, it, if the cookie crumbles the other way, you know, he might be asked to, you know, in fairness, just, just give up a car, but also he's the junior driver. Like Al, like Alex is a, has, was a pretty reliable generator of points uh, for a team like Williams last year. I just don't think there was any like I'm sure it sucks to travel to a race and then like not get to go, but I don't know. It felt to me like like commentators like kept trying to make something out of this, and I just couldn't un, I couldn't fathom I couldn't fathom being in like Logan Sargent's shoes or like at Williams and feeling like it's freighted with this many implications. Yeah, I think. Um, well, so. I, I, I think it, it ex, it's probably a case of, and this is something that I do think the commentators are guilty of, is really latching on to one story and just kind of hounding it, uh, you know, <laughs> flogging it um, until it is dead. Uh, I think, though, that the at least the emotions are, are there's some kernel of truth to that. So, you know, Val's said, uh, James Val's team principal of uh, Williams said, uh, this decision to to put Albon in Sargent's car uh, to give a maximum chance for for points. Um, this decision was not made lightly. This is from uh, F1.com, and we cannot thank Logan enough for his graceful acceptance, demonstrating his dedication to the team. He is a true team player. Logan said, uh, "called this the hardest moment I can remember in my career," and I can understand that. You know, like you're 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 a driver. All you want to do is drive. Um, I imagine that this is, you know, probably the the apex of those moments when a driver is told to move aside for his teammate, right? Like, yeah, you get it. It's for the the betterment of the team, and some drivers have no problem doing that. We'll we'll talk about Oscar Piastri doing that in this race. Um, some drivers have a hard time doing it, and you know, it's circumstantial uh, as well. But um, I think this is sort of the just the, you know, the. Uh, yeah, the the most intense version of that, but it can't be easy. Uh, I I, it, I would say it, as a driver, it can't be. But I certainly I, I saw that quote from from Logan, and I I certainly thought if I were in his shoes, I would also make a meal out of it. I would also be like, just because you don't want to give way too easily, you want there to you know feel like, hey, I'm doing everyone a solid by being a being a trooper here, but yeah. like it does suck. That's something like, you can in your back pocket, right? Like, remember when I did that for you guys? Yeah, but. Let's be real. You're telling me that this seriously wasn't wor worse than when he th threw that car into the wall at uh, the Netherlands, you know, in a good in what had otherwise been a really good qualifying performance. Like, you're like, you know, what I mean, it's it's like here he sacrificed yeah. for the team. He's had way worse moments 
uh, as an F1 driver in his career, like way more like, uh, what, are you, what are you doing here, kid? Wow, you really, you really wrecked things for the team again. Uh, so I don't know. I, fo- I found that kind of, I, I found like some of the, the stuff that was made out of this kind of funny. But also I think it's like, especially for people who've been around the sport for ages, I think things like the absurd court politics of Ferrari and who, you know, what Michael did to Rubens and then later what Alonzo did to Felipe. I think this stuff looms so large that it's almost like for commentators of a certain vintage vintage, it has like eliminated their ability to reasonably analyze what are pretty clear pragmatic team decisions. Uh, but I do think it also helps that as we talked about last week, Val seems like a guy whose decision making process is transparent enough and he is clear enough like what he means by certain things that he is not going to backdoor demote somebody or marginalize them at the team just to avoid like coming out and saying like here's our number one like it i am sure logan and alex have very clear understanding of like where things stand that probably makes it a hell of a lot easier when you have to tell someone they got to take one for the team yeah i mean val's thing is that he's data driven right and so this is purely he can he can fall back on like this is a mathematical decision um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't you don't see it you don't see it very often. A team not having a spare chassis around. Um, but yeah, so Alex, the lone Williams lines up twelfth. Valtteri Bottas in thirteenth, followed by uh, Kevin Magnussen, Esteban Ocon in fifteenth. Into Q two in that Alpine, he was he was elated uh, to not be knocked out. Um, Nico Hulkenberg lines up sixteenth, followed by Pierre Gasly, Daniel Ricciardo, the other Australian. Uh, had gotten into Q2, but had his time deleted for track limits. And then Zhou Guanyu, who did qualify 19th, but in the process went over a curb and damaged his front wing, which required uh, his team to fit a new one of a different spec, meaning that he will start from the pit lane. Um, Rob, do you want to take us through the start, or I can? Uh, please do like I don't have too many notes from the start honestly yeah. it, like because stuff starts happening with Max real fast so, yeah so it's it's from uh, on lap one at least it's it's clean through turn one with Verstappen leading uh, off the line well uh, Russell does get around Perez at turn three for sixth place which uh, with a move that I thought was pretty good um, and then lap two signs closes on Verstappen on the back straight and sweeps around him as they head through that turn nine and ten complex which was surprising um i was kind of like looking around going is is this way different than that because there were certain sort of like rumblings of uh, i don't know red bull's not you know uh looking uh a hundred percent dominant in in practice right but they, um, they so say thought, that all the time to try and like trick yeah. you into be like if you're in the commentary business, you got to trick people into being like, don't turn, don't change that dial. Red Bull hasn't looked right this whole weekend, and like most of most of the time you hear that, that turns out to be not true or not true enough to erase the you know few tenths that Max tend to have have in his back pocket. Um, and then you know Red Bull tend to be downplay their chances a little bit, and it looked at least at the start. Like it was going to go according to plan where Max drives off. But yeah, as you, as you pointed out, like he didn't, like I was startled there, like lap, like lap two, uh, where it's like the margin is not getting pulled out and actually signs of like rapidly closing in on him. But then we get that delayed radio message around that same time where Max is radio back to the Red Bull pit. I think it's like, I think the message plays like right after the pass, Mm -hmm. but that means that the radio message I think came before the pass, but it's where he's talking about like he just lost the rear end Re- yeah. and it was real weird. Yeah. And, and Brundle actually pointed out that, um, he for Stappen like twitched, uh, in the preceding corners, which allowed, uh, signs to pull up faster. So, um, the, but all that was just sort of conjecture, uh, we understand two laps later as smoke appears out the back of Verstappen's car, followed shortly thereafter by fire that, um, well, I guess I'll finish out here. What we see is that he goes into the pits. It's clear that the issue is with the right rear brake pad, 
Uh, and <laughs> we get a cool replay of him coming into the pits and something just like explodes out the side of his car, which boy, good thing that wasn't in the pit lane. Uh, cause that may have hurt somebody. Um, but in the interview, uh, with Verstappen afterward, he explains that the brake on that wheel, the rear right had been engaged from the start of the race, basically like he was driving with the handbrake on. So that's what it takes to pass Max Verstappen is he leaves the handbrake on. And to be clear, it's not something that he did. It was a, a technical uh, issue. It does make um, that radio message kind of odd. If if they were seeing that the brake was stuck early, that it would be kind of weird that he's sending a message talking about, gosh, lost the car there for a second. That was strange if uh, you know they were struggling with this issue from, from uh, the line. But yeah, it was it was a really weird looking incident because it was throwing the blue smoke you, you associate with engines, but you could tell that it was coming off the inside rim of the uh, of the tire. It was a a very strange thing, but yeah, it took him off the board really really quickly, and so suddenly uh, it was Ferrari in the proverbial catbird seat, uh, you know, with this with this race, and Max nowhere to be seen. Yeah, it, uh, we should say it was a terminal issue, uh, and Verstappen did retire from the race. The first time he has retired in 43 races uh, since, actually, Australia of 2022, uh, thus ending his bid for another 10 race wins in a row. Um, yeah, leaving signs in the lead, followed by Norris, Leclerc, and Piastri. The next to go out is Verstappen's 2021 championship rival, Lewis Hamilton, who retires with an engine failure on lap 17. Uh, after which we get a, a virtual safety car that benefits one Fernando Alonso, who had not pitted at that point, uh, along with Hulkenberg and Gasly. That was the most incredible. Like, just uh, this is a guy who has had accidents arranged for him, and this one still <laughs> like could not have worked out better. Uh, th this was <laughs> this one's still up there in terms of uh, fortunate fortunate things uh, to, to fortunate timings for Fernando Alonso. Uh, but yeah, it was it wasn't like it was ever a good weekend for for Lewis the way the the way the car was behaving. But um, you know, I, I think at this point now, at least once or twice a race, the Mercedes drivers will just get on the radio to comment about how much faster another car seems like, boy, that thing's a rocket ship. Look at that. Yeah. They're turning the old men like at, at, at a highway rest stop, right? Like, woof, <laughs> that baby was cooking. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, you know, spectators of their own race. But uh, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, I feel like last week and heading into this weekend, Everyone at Mercedes was trying to be really measured about like how things are going. Uh, you know, Lewis talking about like it's just a much better car. It, you know, it doesn't have the the evil characteristics of the previous design. Um, but I think that I think that sort of measured positivity is also running its course uh, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, lap eighteen, Ocon pits with actually the the same smoking area as Verstappen had. Uh, but the team sends him back out after the, his pit stop saying that a tear off had gotten stuck in the brake duct, the uh, sort of sticky thing across the visor that that drivers uh, have, you know, stacked on there and they can tear it off. Um, this seems to happen a non-trivial number of times, and it is, in fact, not the last time that we'll bring it up uh, in this race. It's a Brundle hobby horse that they it should really be forced is. to have some sort of like disposal, which... I'm curious to think he's, he's probably right. Like, the fact that these things are routinely now compromising cars behind them, uh, they should maybe create a little affordance to have a, a little waste slot for uh, for the tear-offs in the cockpit. Yeah. Um, Perez, who had been trying to retake the place uh, on Russell that he lost at the opening lap, um, pitted a few laps before... Uh, the virtual safety car, but crucially six laps after Russell and by lap 21 had made it back up to him, uh, getting Russell at the end of the back straight into turn nine. And a few laps later passes Alonzo for fifth in the same place. So Perez, uh, moving up the field. Um, we haven't talked about McLaren too much yet, but Piastri pitted on lap 10, I believe to cover Leclerc 
while Norris stayed out for five more laps, which meant that Piastri effectively undercut Norris um, when Norris pitted. So when Norris comes back out, he's behind Leclerc, or I'm uh, uh, sorry, Piastri uh, in fourth. But with those new tires, um, I assume, McLaren decides to swap the cars on lap 27 to let Norris chase down Leclerc, and Piastri does so uh, without complaint. What did you make like, this, Rob? It just seems like some of these things, it's like, it's it's such, it's so clearly the right call, yeah. uh, especially given how tricky it is keeping these tires and like the right window to have pace to maybe set up an attack on someone else that wasting that energy on a teammate is, is just so foolish that, you know, I think if, uh, I think any place like a team has run things in such a way that the, the drivers can't be, <laughs> they can't be normal about these calls. Like anytime the, the, the second, like, you know, someone's coming up behind on a different strategy. The second that turns into a debate over the radio, like, I think you've really you've really lost control of your ability to execute team strategy, uh, and it's it's shocking how many teams tolerate that as the status quo, where you're gonna have like a hostage negotiation live <laughs> on the air, uh, when you know the time those tires gonna be in their in their window can sometimes be measured in a few laps. Yeah, I think it's interesting when that happens to ponder why it's happening. Is it you know can you always chalk it up to the hot headedness or egotism of a driver. I don't think so. I think you can, especially recently in recent years, there's been cause for drivers to doubt their teams. Um, and yeah. we, I think recent, most recently, like in the past few seasons, we haven't necessarily seen too much of that. Um, yeah. Have we it seen is... the shoe on the other foot with Norris that much? Sorry. Have we seen the shoe on the other foot that much with Norris? I don't think so. Not that I can recall. He was always ahead of Daniel, pretty much. So he's always comfortably beating the hell out of him. And then Piastri's come in as a clear junior. Sometimes positionally he's ahead. But like uh, when they've had to make way, they've been able to. Because I am curious. Because sometimes I do get the sense that like Norris is a little less secure about that. And you know will be a bit more prickly about, uh, you know, team you know team orders coming in but piastri and just he does seems... have that sorry he he does have that relationship right that long-running relationship with the team i yeah. can see him you know adopting a sort of what are you going to do fire me kind of yeah. attitude um uh, i don't know i don't know that he would do that but uh it's it's i guess more conceivable than the the newbie piastri yeah uh, Leclerc, for his part, pits on lap 35 and comes out just ahead of Perez and Alonso and does a good job of keeping them behind. Uh, lap 41, Sonoda gets by Gasly with a great late lunge down the inside uh, for ninth place. I think that was, was that turn six or so. Um, and then we get a, a potentially scary moment with Hulkenberg defending from Albon with some pretty late moves. Uh, I predict this is not the last that we will see this season of Williams tangling with Haas cars. Um, At every point matters so much to these teams. Yes. Like, yeah, I think, I think you're right. It's going to be, you know, they talk, we, we've talked about before. Sometimes drivers keep running afoul of each other just because like the way their hardware is matching up and the their, their own race pace matches up. Uh, the way like Hamilton and, and Albin kept tripping over each other when Albin was at Red Bull. Uh, but, yeah, this these these two teams just in terms of pace, I think you're gonna keep running into each other and you know, I think Magnuson certainly is the he's the harder of the two racer racers. Uh mm -hmm. but you know, Hulkenberg is not a pushover either. Yeah. Uh yeah, it's gonna keep happening. Yeah, contrast that with like Joe and Botas, and I don't I well, don't see them as as formidable opponents for some reason they don't feel that way to me i think that's because their races keeps keeps getting mooted in the pits it's like <laughs> that I, like is, i think that's very I think true. you would see some fireworks except that like hey shout out to valtteri Bottas. he was running he was driving a great race like he was having a really good race weekend coming together and yet again uh cross started wheel nut i think here it not only that, like I think they had one that was like they had another cross thread at this race, but then also they instituted a team rule 
that they were going to do slow tire changes to deal with this like chronic cross threading they've got right and uh you know Ted, ted kravitz was explaining and there's there's an article over at the race about this like what's going on with with sour pit stops and their explanation is uh there's a thermal issue with you know doing the wheels like it's not coming up in practice and it wasn't coming up in testing but mm-hmm. running at race pace the the heat uh coming off the the wheel nut assembly and the the guns they're using all the guns are bespoke it's causing these like lockups and jams in the pit in the pits and like on the one hand I'm really sympathetic to that like that's well that sounds annoying but also I feel like the wheel nut is largely a solved problem in F1 for it to become this chronic for a team to like have it go this bad. I don't know. This to me is like when (laughs) this to me is like when your favorite appliance manufacturer starts swapping in the plastic parts without telling anyone and suddenly everyone's like blender turns to shit. This is kind of how it feels where it's like, uh, you know, they're not owning up to the fact that, yeah, we are using, sorry, our, (laughs) our, our wheel guns are made of plastic now, uh, and the and the heat of the nut just like shears off the uh, the threads. I don't know it, it. It just doesn't seem this is not a good problem to have. No, it's not. And I I wonder. I I've, I've got to imagine that this is not like it's not a quick fix, right? Otherwise, they would have just gone. They would have just swapped out this part, right? The fact that it's happening over and over again means that it is. It is an entire assembly that they are having to redesign and remanufacture. And, you know, meanwhile, they're just having to go out and race with whatever they got. So um, and, and how many teams like so there's safety margin here. And I think they again, I, I'm pretty sure they still had a had a wheel get stuck. But their safety margin was to have five second pit stops. How many cars, not the Red Bull, can say it's a two stop race, right? How many cars can just spot six seconds stationary and have that not translate to like meaningful falls down the order? I don't think there's many. Yeah. Like you're effectively like these pit stops are taking them out of the running regardless what the drivers do. Um, I think I think Valtteri's quietly like showing quite a bit of pace this year and Joe has had moments as well. Yeah, it's um, if I'm reading this information on uh, racefans.net correctly, Joe had a nine second pit stop and Valtteri had a 19 second pit stop. Not not the best. Um, Let's see, where were we? Uh, Yes. So Magnuson, (laughs) speaking of Williams and, and Haas, spends quite a few laps trying to pass Albon and eventually does so down into turn nine on lap 45 that will prove to be a pivotal pass uh and as we are winding down enjoying signs trip to the top of the podium we cut on the last lap to russell's on board as he's in the middle of a crash and you know when the horizon isn't level it's scary um thankfully i thought we were catching him mid tumble yes uh on replay the crash does not look as bad he he skids a little heading into turn six which he then well, this, corrects clear we'd seen him trying to close the gap on alonzo for several yes. laps like he was he was in a good attacking position probably had the better pace overall but the mercedes is not a quick car in the straight line and so he could bring it closer during the corners but was not ever able to like set up an attack uh, and we'd sort of just, that was the last we'd seen of it. And then, yeah, it looks like what happened here, because on replay, to me, it looked weird immediately. The minute we saw Russell's in car, it looked a little bit weird to me. My first thought when, when he had the accident, having not seen what happened, I thought he'd pulled another, um, was it Vegas or Singapore last year, where the where he just follows Norris into the wall? Um, oh, yeah, I, th- I think it was Singapore. It was Singapore. Yeah, but like I thought he did, he'd done it again, where yeah. it was just like him fumbling another late race uh, attack, and I, and and maybe there's people out there who who do feel that's still what happened, but that was my suspicion when it when it first happened. I was gonna you know I was gonna go down as get another entry in the ledger of like George Russell maybe not having the complete like 
package of a high-end F1 driver um, when it comes to like these moments in the clutch. But when we got his in-car, um, the first thing you see is obviously he loses all the air off his front wing as he comes up behind Alonzo and just runs wide onto a very narrow uh, gravelly runoff uh, on the outside of a corner and clips the wall and then sort of gets launched sideways. Uh, the, the, the wheels kind of separate from the chassis and are held on by the tethers and he goes, he goes for a ride. Um, but on that replay, like Alonzo looked really slow. It was like he was, it's like when you're coming up on a distressed car or like, you know, really off the pace lap traffic, it looked a little weird to me, uh, just in terms of how, how slow Alonzo was moving, uh, given, given the pace that Alonzo had to maintain throughout that duel to keep ahead of Russell. I assume maybe Alonzo was recovering from his own near miss. Maybe he was also at the limit, but seems like the FIA, uh, it seems like the stewards didn't feel this was a normal one. No. So they, after the race, so let's, this is, um, uh, we get it. We get a virtual safety car. Um, this is the final lap. So the race ends under virtual safety car, despite Russell's frantic calls for a red flag. Uh, which are frankly kind of harrowing to to listen to uh, in the, the team radio. Because uh, he's in the middle of the track. He's in the middle of the track. He's like, you need to stop this race immediately. Um, which, that's that's a different conversation. Um, so after the race, the stewards handed a drive-through penalty to Alonzo, though because the race was over, that was converted to a 20-second time penalty, dropping him from 6th to 8th. And their reasoning was that after having heard from both drivers that Alonzo slowed intentionally, and they point out 100 meters earlier than he ever had into that corner. And irrespective of his intentions, it was a potentially dangerous move given the circumstances and therefore uh, the 20 second time penalty. Uh, Alonzo stated that he was just trying to get a better exit quote, uh, sa- sacrificing entry speed to have good exits from corners is part of the art of motorsport. Um, this is oh, these quotes for, from uh, from race fans. The subtext here, though, is that the DRS detection point is just after turn six. So if Alonso could somehow get a greater than one second buffer to Russell, then Russell would be less likely to pass him on this, the final lap of the race. So if he could somehow... I don't know if the intent here is to uh, back up to check up on Russell to make Russell check up on Alonzo um, or maybe it's a, you know, a double win scenario, two birds scenario where Alonzo gets a a better exit from that corner than Russell would, thus increasing the gap. And then if, you know, Russell has to check up all the better. Um, Russell says, I was half a second behind him and approaching the corner, and then suddenly he slowed up very dramatically and got back on the power. I just wasn't expecting it, and it caught me by surprise. What do you think of all this, Rob? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, again, this is this is a level of racing that I can't totally, like, I can't sort of put myself in the car. Um, yeah. To me, it did look weird. Just like, for, like even Alonzo's explanation of, of, of you know sacrificing entry speed to to get exit speed. I'm not entirely sure that meshes with the con the the sort of profile of that corner. Uh, he was over. It's a, it's sort of a sweeper, right? And he's he's over on the inside. Uh, I don't know. It, it just doesn't. That's not the kind of corner where y- you can sacrifice a ton of entry speed. It feels like to me. Uh, and then have that like come back your way on on exit. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a weird thing, but but also I I tend to believe when the stewards pull car telemetry data and they see something really incriminating, I tend to believe them. Right, like when you have something really abnormal pop up uh, in in like the driver's inputs, and it looks like you're brake checking somebody. Uh, you might be brake checking somebody. I'm. I, I am inclined to think that that because because so like so often you hear like F one drivers going back and back and back to race 
hard safely requires a lot of trust. There has to be a degree of predictability in what the other driver is going to do. And that wasn't predictable. I don't think if you're, I don't think if you're George, you, 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 you foresee Alonzo coming off it that fast in a part of course that, that, that is that narrow. Um, and George had to go into crash evasion mode, you know, rather than making a sort of tactical move. Um, right. and also just because of aerodynamics, he loses the ability to control the car, uh, just cause like he's, you know, cause of where this is all unfolding. So I, I am inclined to believe that like they got Alonzo, uh, you know, you know, working in the gray a little bit. I think if I'm Mercedes, I'm still looking at this, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a black mark for George, but like it might be a gray mark, right? Where you kind of want. I want to see you avoid this. I want to see you. Yeah. I want to see this not turn into a DNF. Yeah. Uh, well, the the Fs uh, in this race were Carlos signs on top. He finishes the, the race out under virtual safety car and gets the win. Uh, I saw a stat that said um, in the past eleven months. The only drivers to win races have been Carlos Sainz and Max Verstappen. Smooth operator, baby. That's right. Uh, Charles Leclerc in second. Lando Norris in third. And interestingly, after the race, if we recall that decision to run Norris longer, according to this race fans article, that was not the plan. Quote, McLaren's attempt to get Norris ahead of Leclerc ran into trouble when the Ferrari driver came in on the very lap they intended for their driver. I wondered Norris. about that. Yeah, this is Norris talking now. The lap we were going to undercut, he boxed. So then, again, you have to go off and do a kind of different strategy. We got close in the second stint. I got very close. If I boxed, I think I would have uh, I would, I would, have undercut. But he boxed, so I missed that opportunity. I think our pace was not as good as Carlos, but probably better than Charles. So I think, if I was honest, maybe we missed out a little bit on an opportunity to be P2 today. That would have been very interesting. Um, yeah, that was that, that was an interesting moment in the pits there. You saw the two pit crews come out, and then Norris uh, sort, sort of uh, goes goes flying past uh, the, the pit entrance. Real, real quick, I just also want to call out again, um, yet, yet another race where Signs seems to be calling the strategy from the cockpit hmm. and doing quite a good job. Like He seems to have a very good sense of, this is how I want this to race to unfold. In, including like sort of advocating for like this is what is going to make me most comfortable right he was calling out like i do not want to come out of the pits in a fight you know let me stay out and create my own buffer willing to maybe risk it being exposed to the undercut a little bit because he was out in clean air and he didn't seem afraid of the undercut whereas i think every other strategist on the grid was a little bit he was he was willing to to chance it and and stay out there a little bit. So like, you know, his his wins tend to be his wins tend to feel like quality wins where uh you know, he he's doing a very good job win or lose, we're going to do the race that I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um and I think that <laughs> I think it's a very useful thing. That's a useful set of guardrails to put around the Ferrari pit wall at this time as they're sort of getting that operation uh arrived. I am curious what you make of to me, this still feels like lightning struck Max and took him off the board. And I am less convinced that this was Ferrari's race. There's been some, you know, a couple of websites are like, here's the new the new upgrades or the new the new approach that letting <laughs> Ferrari, you know, steal this win. And like Max's brake froze. Like basically <laughs> that's that's what happened. But I was struck by this um, you know, uh who was it? Was it Perez saying afterwards? Yeah, uh, so that I, there was just no way Max was going to win. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'll finish off the top five here: Oscar Piastri four, uh, fourth, and uh, Sergio Perez fifth. He did say after the race um, that so he he actually also had a tear off uh, get lodged somewhere in his car on the floor. Um, apparently right after he passed Alonzo on lap 26. Um, but on top of that, he also said, uh, and this from race fans, 
When asked whether Ferrari would have won even if Verstappen hadn't retired, he said, absolutely yes. We already saw last year in a track like this, for example, Vegas, uh, a front-limited track. Ferrari was a lot stronger than us, so we just couldn't look after the front tires. Now, he obviously has uh, a vested interest in saying that, because that would explain his No mortal place. man could have kept up with right. Carlos Sainz today. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I thought that, thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, I, like, I don't know. I, I tend to think that if Max's car is 100%, uh, maybe we would have had a hell of a fight. But I just don't, I don't think Ferrari, you know, we saw the qualifying. It just didn't look like Ferrari had any sort of, you know, real pace advantage they could count on. Uh, versus versus the Red Bull, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm you know I'm I'm not looking at this as even though it's done exciting things to the ta- the the cha- the standings tables, I'm not looking at this as like a season reset. Yeah, uh, Lance Stroll in six, Yuki Tsunoda seventh, Fernando Alonso eighth after that penalty, uh, Nico Hulkenberg ninth, and Kevin Magnussen in tenth. Double points for Gene Haas and team. Uh, Alex Albon missed out on a point by less than a second. He comes home in 11th. Uh, Daniel Ricciardo, 12th. Pierre Gasly, 13th. Valtteri Bottas uh, and Joe Guan Yu in 14th and 15th. And finally, Esteban Ocon ahead of the DNFs of George Russell, Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen, and the did-not-start of Logan Sargent. Uh, with neither George Russell nor Lewis Hamilton finishing, Mercedes ended a 62-race scoring streak, uh, which tied their previous best scoring streak. Uh, the stats from uh, F1.com. Their last failure to score points was Azerbaijan 2021. This is also Hamilton's worst ever start to a season, with a 7th, 9th, and DNF. His previous worst three races were at McLaren in 2007, where he went DNF, 6th, and 7th. Um, and if not for Alonso's penalty, Mercedes would be 5th in the Constructors' Championship right now. Um, and that's, uh, that's the Australian Grand Prix. Um, and that is it for the race recap. We are going to take a quick break, and then we will be back with the news. All right, Rob, we're back with the news. A lot of FIA-oriented <laughs> stuff to talk about uh, this week. Um, so, Mohammed Ben Suliam is the president of the FIA, which is the governing body of F1 uh, and many other international motorsports. And just to sort of reset here, a, a whistleblower a few weeks ago alleged that Ben Suliam did two things. He, one, pressured stewards to overturn an Alonzo penalty at the 2023 Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. And the other alleged action was that Ben Suliam told officials to find a way not to certify the Las Vegas Grand Prix as safe for racing last year. So these claims were brought before the FIA's ethics committee, Uh, which after 30 days of inquiry involving 11 witnesses has now uh, issued their verdict, which states after reviewing the results of the inquiries, the ethics committee were unanimous in their determination that there was no evidence to substantiate allegations of interference of any kind involving the FIA president, Mohammed Ben Suliam. So for some color on this, Autosport has some quotes from uh, RB CEO Peter Beyer, um, who was formerly the F1 executive director at the FIA. So uh, Beyer, Bayer, I'd be Bayer, um, says uh, the FIA are capable because there's elected people who have roles. There's an independent ethics committee. Since when I was there, we've established the compliance officer uh, and whistleblowing hotlines. One thing that we see is the sport has grown massively in a very short amount of time. A lot of people are asking for transparency. I guess, I guess we will have to try and understand where we can have transparency because when it's about individual topics or complaints coming through a whistleblowing hotline, you have to make sure there is absolute guarantee and protection of the people doing the whistleblowing. We have to have confidence in the organization. It's the same when we have a steward's decision 
or something else. Uh, sometimes we might not like the decisions, but ultimately we have to be happy with the process. Uh, Zach Brown is sort of of the other uh, end of the spectrum. He's the one uh, calling a lot more for transparency. Um, and, you know, I would say pointing out the fact that this is the FIA Ethics Committee investigating the FIA. Maybe, maybe <laughs> there's something else that could have been done uh, or, or this could have been arranged differently. Um, before we move on, Rob, uh, what's your take on all this? I mean, it was a weird story to begin with. Um, it, it, it sort of dovetailed with, uh, you know, Ben Sulliam's reputation as kind of a klutz um, and uh, a, a bit of a clown when it comes to how he goes about, you know, goes about, uh, you know, carrying out the duties of his office. I think... You know, I hear the you know uh, the, the the bear comments. Uh, you know, coming from someone affiliated with 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 Red Bull right now, right? I mean, yeah, I am not sure anyone at that team is going to be casting stones or aspersions on an internal investigation. Not like you know, maybe not being serious enough. Uh, you know, about like ferreting out wrongdoing. I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, I, he had, yes, he has firsthand experience, like, working in those offices with some some of those people. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's a valuable perspective. But also, I just, I'm not sure anyone at Red Bull is going to, right now, especially go out on a limb, go out on the limb and say, well, we need to get, we need to get a truly independent board in here to investigate what's going on. Um, I don't think it's going to come from Red Bull. And the thing I can't quite parse is just, like, the stuff about the Vegas certification, it's just weird. You know what I mean? Like, like some of the stuff that, that was alleged here, I just don't understand what the play was, hmm. except to, like, throw sand in the gears of FOM. I just don't get it. Yeah, I don't either. Um, but this is not the only ethics thing the FIA has going. Um, and again, to sort of reset this story, Susie Wolf, who's the director of the F1 Academy series and the wife of Mercedes team principal Toto Wolf, uh, was the subject of an FIA inquiry over a conflict of interest, given that her husband runs the Mercedes team. At the time, this was met with incredibly strong pushback from not only the Wolf's and Mercedes, but the other nine teams of Formula One who issued identical statements saying that they did not lodge the complaint and have no issue uh, with the Wolves. Um, two days after that, the FIA dropped the investigation. So now uh, Susie Wolf says that she has filed a, quote, criminal complaint in the French courts in relation to the statements made about me by the FIA last December. The FIA is uh, headquartered in France. Quote, there has still not been any transparency or accountability in the relation to the conduct of the FIA and its personnel in this matter. I feel more than ever it is important to stand up to call out improper behavior and make sure people are held to account. While some may think silence absolves them from responsibility, it does not. So... Legal proceedings, Rob. Criminal I don't fully complaint. The criminal, I guess this is a French law thing. Maybe someone who knows can let us know. I don't understand what the what the criminal complaint would be. Is this a? Uh, I know libel rules can be different in the UK and yeah, perhaps it be a in England. Matter in like yeah. in France. I don't know. It's that uh, I'm just I'm just going off what I know of like U.S. law, um, and it just doesn't seem like it, you'd see a civil complaint maybe about this. And even there, I'm not sure you would have that much of a case because ultimately, yeah, the FIA kind of ham-fistedly <laughs> did a grand opening, grand closing of an ethics investigation of uh, the Wolves, effectively. But in that, I don't, I don't see that they did anything too open, like not even like too openly libelous. I mean, they didn't. They didn't really spell out what they were investigating in a way that could be read as an accusation. And so I'm not entirely sure what the criminal complaint is. But hmm. this might be a French law thing that is that is beyond me. Uh, well, just to um, 
touch on the last uh, <laughs> thing the FIA has going. Um, sort of a, a, a no news news update. The the woman who accused Christian Horner of inappropriate behavior, uh, a matter which was investigated and then dismissed by Red Bull before the company suspended her, in addition to appealing Red Bull's findings, has lodged an official complaint with the FIA. And as of now, the FIA has declined to say whether it is investigating the matter. And here I'll quote from a BBC article. Meanwhile, over the course of the Bahrain Grand Prix weekend, Ben Suliam approached Red Bull driver Max Verstappen and said he should make a public statement supporting Horner. Uh, Verstappen responded, closes, so, I'm sorry, Verstappen responded, sources close to the world champion have told BBC Sport, by telling Ben Suliam he should launch his own investigation into the matter. So I didn't hear that last part before. Yeah. I knew yeah. that Suliam had requested... The vote of confidence with which itself is just wildly out of pocket. Like, yeah, who on earth are you to approach someone at Red Bull and tell them, like, you should give Christian Horner a vote of con- boy. Talk about like <laughs> if the FIA does investigate this, uh, that investigation doesn't seem like it'll be worth a whole like a whole hell of a lot, uh, you know, coming from an office, you know, affiliated with uh with with Sulium, but it's just such a such a weird request. But the notion that Verstappen retorted with, you know, an exhortation like "investigate it yourself" is very interesting. Um, but yeah, just a weird weird decision uh, to just yeah. go wade in there. FIA just having a normal one over the past uh, <laughs> few months. Uh, speaking of having a normal one. James Vowles, uh, when he came in to run Williams, I think we we mentioned something along these lines um, a few episodes ago that, you know, he he entered this new company, Williams, this team. And, you know, as a team principal, you have to kind of do the, the full evaluation of, all right, how does everything get, get done here? Where can we make improvements? And he had he made some offhanded comment about, like, they don't have any inventory software. And we talked a little bit about that. Um, uh, the Race, the-race.com, has an article that explains exactly what he means. And so these quotes here from James Vowles talking about the fact that they tracked every part and may still track every part on the car in Microsoft Excel. He says, the Excel list was a joke, impossible to navigate and impossible to update. Take a front wing. A front wing is about 400 different bits. And when you say, I would like one single front wing, please, what you need to kick off is the metallic bits and the carbon bits that make that up. So you need to go into the system and they need to be ordered. Is a front wing more important than a front wishbone in that circumstance? When do they go through? When is the inspection? When you start tracking now hundreds of thousands of components through your organization moving around, an Excel spreadsheet is useless. You need to know where each one of those independent components are, how long it will take before it's complete, how long it will take before it goes to inspection. If there's been any problems with problems with inspections, whether it has to go back again. And once you start putting that level of complexity in which, uh, where, in which is where modern Formula One is, the Excel spreadsheet falls over and humans fall over, and that's exactly where we are. What I'm trying to work out there is... Is he saying that the Excel spreadsheet they're using would have like 20,000 lines in it with all the subcomponents that go into like wings and other bits and bobbins? Or is he saying that like you'd, you'd open their cell sheet and it's like front wing to, you know, order <laughs> status, yes, no, or something like that. Right. Like, and there'd be no data about the rest of those parts. Like, both seem bad. Uh, I, you know, I think we've all worked in places where there are sort of legacy excels that mm-hmm. exist that like it's never closed right it, like it's it's it stays open 
on machines that touch it for for ages because <laughs> right. like you just can't you can't open it you can't close it you just like go in you edit it and you know you don't breathe on it uh you, you touch it as little as possible because like it, it it's uh just a a sucking chest wound in the memory of the machine but yeah i'm i'm, I'm really curious if either it was like the bar like the equivalent of a bar napkin describing like the various parts you got like you want a wing? Yeah, we got those. You want a <laughs> like you want a side pod? Yeah, we got side pod. Or is it like, all right, time to figure out what's going on with the wing, and we'll have that answer in fifteen minutes after the page loads. Well, I think it was. It sounds like it was. They were tracking every piece, and it was just buckling under the complexity because they've talked about in the past, like not knowing where certain parts are like James Fowles goes, where's this? And they have to go physically find it. There's no record of it being anywhere. Um, I think so. What, what they've said basically is that, um, and I might be pulling this from, I was listening to that, that, that podcast that we mentioned a, a few, um, uh, episodes ago where he, he's, I think it's the high performance podcast. I went and listened to it. And it's, it's fascinating. Um, he's talking about, how basically they are having to rip the bandaid off with this because you can imagine, you know, except for the mandated shutdown periods, the F1 team doesn't really stop. They're always building the next car. And so you can't just like say, all right, stop using the Excel spreadsheet. We're using this new thing now. Like how do you translate all that information and workflow over? They've effectively had to do that and still be making a car at the same time. And that's what's yeah. been really, really difficult. And that's why they don't have a third chassis to spare. Um, but they're doing this because going forward, they need to have something sustainable. That's why this, is, this Excel spreadsheet, I imagine, has been around for so long. Because you just can't replace it easily. Um, he said in that interview that they are not really worrying about 2024 and they're not really even worrying about 2025. They are trying to rip off all the band-aids um, so that when they, when 2026 rolls around and we get the new regulations, that's when they can really hit the ground running. Uh, and I am, uh, I, I like listening to those podcasts. I've been watching all their YouTube stuff because it's just, it's fascinating. It's almost like watching a formula one team boot up from the ground. I really want the workplace comedy about this starring Tom Hardy uh, as James Vowles, like just a, uh, you know, leave, leaving just the sleek, like high, like high performance, super, you know, super corporate tech centric uh, world of Mercedes and going to, well, kind of the place you remember from the Williams documentary where you have the poor yeah. little abandoned Williams brother haunting the spare parts library the archive yeah. yeah well and there's a little detail in this in this piece of the race that uh, i just wanted to call out that a th that the thing that was complicating this and they were losing time to is people kept fishing around for old parts that wouldn't fit the new car but maybe with a little tinkering and adapting they could be made to fit the new car hmm. and i too you know I too have had drawers full of like weird, you know, this is like you do a PC build, right? It's like, you never know when you need a screw that's exactly that like shape uh -huh. and, and size. So better, better keep that here. And it kind of sounds like Williams was operating the same way where it's like, well, hang on now. That's a perfectly good nut. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, uh, I wish them luck and I, I, I <laughs> just, uh, yeah. Um, that's I really am enjoying the the transparency. Speaking of tr that word uh, that James Bowles is is giving us everyone into this uh, this weird situation. Um, speaking of team principles, Rob Zach Brown. Yeah, uh, not 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 big news here, but like he's uh, despite maybe some moments uh, to the, the imply the contrary during Drive to Survive. Uh, Zach Brown very firmly ensconced at McLaren. Uh, signed a new contract with McLaren to remain as CEO uh, until 2030. So he is he is in it now uh, for you know this entire transition to the new the new formula in 2026. Uh, 
yeah, like long term future seems seems very stable there, and that sort of continues the trend. It feels like we have here to long tenured, uh, you know, long long ten- tenured F one team principles. Yeah. Um, all right, that's it for the news. I'll just run down the driver standings uh, as a result of the Australian Grand Prix. Red Bull Racing's Max Verstappen is still on top with fifty one points. Right behind him, though, Charles Leclerc with 47. That is maybe as close as they're going to get. Sergio Perez is in third with 46 points. Carlos Sainz in fourth with 40. Oscar Piastri is in fifth with 28 points, followed by his teammate Lando Norris, one point behind with 27. George Russell's in seventh with 18. Fernando Alonso has 16. Lance Stroll has nine. And Lewis Hamilton is in 10th place with eight points. Uh, Yuki Yuki Tsunoda and Oliver Behrman, uh, tied with six, followed by Nico Hulkenberg with three, and Kevin Magnuson with one. The rest of them, Alex Albon, Joe Guan Yu, Daniel Ricciardo, Esteban Ocon, Pierre Gasly, Valtteri Bottas, and Logan Sargent all have zero. In the constructor standings, Red Bull Racing is on top with 97 points. Ferrari, though, close behind with 93. McLaren is in third with 55. Mercedes in fourth with 26. Aston Martin with 25. Uh, RB is in sixth with six points. Gene Haas and team have four points. And then we've got Williams, Sauber, and Alpine with zero. If you want to join the standings yourself, you can do so by joining our Fantasy League, which in (laughs) uh, the F1 Fantasy website's infinite wisdom has decided to rename our league League 171-035-046-17313. So, catch it. Uh, However, we have the correct standings, it seems, from the Australian Grand Prix. Uh, The podium looks thusly. In third place, we have Silly Season Sommelier. In second, Ooh Ferrari Friends uh, Happy Face Emoticon. And, oh, wow. In first place. This is great. I like this. Flight of the Valtteries. That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, but overall, I, <laughs> I don't know if this is intentional. Um, maybe not, because I see this is happening to multiple other teams. In third place, overall, we have Team 171050550841175. Patrick C's team. Um, in second place, we have enter team name here, X1. And overall, from the Australia podium, we have Ooh Ferrari Friends Happy Face Emoticon with 803 points. Congratulations. Um, my team has dropped to 1,593rd place. Uh, I have. Did somebody DNF perchance? It's possible, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, you can send us an email if you like. Shift F1 podcast at gmail.com or f1.cool slash email. So you can also hit us up on the socials using the links in the show notes. That's us around the internet. Now it is time to take it around the world of racing, the World Rally Championship. Uh, is in Kenya, in Naivasha, for the Safari Rally Kenya this weekend. Formula E is in Tokyo for the Tokyo E-Prix around the Tokyo Big Sight Convention Center, uh, which is, oh, wow. We have not only, so we are in the Tokyo Prefecture, but this may be the first time that we are in a ward. We are in the Koto Ward of the Tokyo metropolis. Uh, the NASCAR Xfinity series is at the Richmond raceway in Richmond, Virginia for the Toyota care 250. But that ain't the only NASCAR. Also at the Richmond raceway, we have the Toyota owners 400. Sensing a theme here with the, the old Toyota. Uh, and that's all we got for racing around relatively quiet weekend 
this fine world. It is, yeah. I feel like um, I think a lot of sports car racing uh, was just popping off. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Things look uh, back up to speed next weekend for sure. Um, final thoughts, I guess, Rob, on uh, Australia. The Science fans are eating. Like they're they're eating good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think if you know, I think there. I know in our community, and I think in a lot of places, there are people who have really felt like Carlos Sainz has not gotten his due. That he has, when given the opportunity to prove he's got the stuff, like he proves it. He does. He does execute, and sometimes appears to be more reliable than his you know, frequently more celebrated teammate. Um, and this is further grist for that mill, right? This, if, if you feel like this guy got done dirty a bit by Ferrari and that if anyone should have, should have been retained, it was him. I can see, you know, I think there's gonna be a lot of people coming away from this, uh, that are going to point to this and say, man, this dude came back from a surgery and cleaned house for Ferrari. Um, you know, I do, I do think, that there there is mounting evidence that this guy's undervalued in F1. Now I don't know if Ferrari, you know, I can certainly understand why Ferrari might still feel that eh, long term our our chances are better with uh with Charles. But he's gonna be somebody's number one driver. And I, or, I think he's gonna do right by them. Uh or we were we um debated talking about this uh, story, the fact that uh, Helmut Marko is out there saying sonoda has been doing well, but he's going to have to still improve if he wants that uh, Red Bull seat. What if, what if Sainz gets that seat? What if he goes back into the Red Bull fold? I really, I mean, in the end, these guys will chase a competitive seat to, you know, through hell. But how many guys have gone back into the F1 program at Red Bull? In a like, Ricardo, you know, did uh, th- through a roundabout way, but like, it's a driver pipeline that uh, you like. You'll never convince me there is not a text message support group among race drivers for guys who came through that program. Yeah, and. I suspect that signs will by inclination uh, and just his read of the situation feel that he can do better elsewhere. Wow. Interesting. I don't know. I guess we shall see. Uh, All right. Well, uh, stay tuned, everyone, for next week. We will be back with our uh, preseason or not preseason pre Japan primer. Um, And if you would like to support the show in the meantime and get access to all of our bonus episodes, the ad-free version of the podcast, and the official Shift F1 Discord, you can do so over at patreon.com slash shift F1. Have a good race weekend, everyone. We will see you all next week. Meow.